Hi, my name is Neil Patel. I'm the founder and CEO of Angels and Entrepreneurs. I started this venture a year ago, and today we have 95,000 members and 52 local chapters across two dozen states. But I'm not surprised. To me, angel investing is the greatest way to build wealth in America, and the only way to potentially turn $500 into millions. I've seen it firsthand. 15 years ago, I was picking up trash and cleaning toilets for $5.75 an hour. Today, I have more money than I ever thought possible. If I wanted to, I could retire tomorrow, but I won't. I love what I do. Not only do I get to invest in companies before everyone else, I also get to interact with the visionaries behind these companies and the venture capitalists who have the foresight to invest in them. And I can do this long before they potentially go public. These are people who in my eyes are born gifted. I'm telling you this because in a moment, you're gonna meet someone who I believe has a superhuman level of intellect and an uncanny ability to make money that is on par with Warren Buffett. His name is David Weisberg. Like me, David is an angel investor, entrepreneur, and venture capitalist. The difference is, unlike everyone else in this business, David didn't begin his career in his 20s, 30s, or even 40s. He started when he was 18 years old. As a freshman in college, David launched a business that made $2 million a year. From there, he started a marketing firm that was later acquired for $25 million. By the time David was 21, he was one of the youngest self-made millionaires in America. At 29, David was an entrepreneur residence for the entire Dartmouth College, one of the most prestigious Ivy League universities. Today, at the age of 34, David has a net worth of over $20 million. And he expects to add 10 million more to his net worth before the end of the year. Of the 55 startups he's invested in, only two have gone out of business. The others are thriving. Many have already gone public, including Compass Therapeutics, DraftKings, Palantir, and Shift. In the world of angel investing, where 50% of startups fail after four years, David's 95% success rate is unparalleled. When he invested in DraftKings, the fantasy sports service back in 2017, the valuation was $1.06 billion. Today, in 2020, the company is valued at more than $14 billion. When David invested in Compass Therapeutics back in 2015, the company was taking their first check. David was able to invest at a $15 million valuation. Today, that company is valued at $270 million. David didn't just double or triple his money on these deals, he netted millions of dollars in profit. And today, for the first time, David has decided to give us details on the same startup companies that he and the richest venture capitalists are investing their money into right now. Startups that are traditionally never seen by everyday investors. Here's how it's gonna work. Over the next few minutes, you're gonna hear from CEOs of a handful of early stage startups that David is investing his money into. David knows these businesses better than anyone, but make no mistake, we didn't just take David's word. Our team at Angels and Entrepreneurs did a deep dive into each of these businesses to make sure that they met our strict investing criteria. So if you ever wanted a chance to make 10, 50, or even 100 times your money in the upcoming years, this is your opportunity. Today, you can learn how to invest alongside the only angel investor I know with the 95% success rate. With that being said, it's time to introduce you to David. Hi, Neil. How are you? Now, David, I know you're not one for showboating, but I've been following your success for quite some time. And before we get started with today's lineup, I have to ask, why are you doing this? You expect to have $30 million in the bank by the end of the year. What's in it for you? That's a fair question, Neil, and it deserves a fair answer. I'm doing this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I wanna build my brand. That's understandable. In the world of venture capital, the more friends you have, the more opportunities you have. Exactly. Secondly, there's literally never been a better time to be an angel investor in America. 2020 has been a tough year for a lot of people. But Neil, you know just as well as I do that, chaos and uncertainty are an angel investor's best friend. That's exactly why I'm aggressively investing at a pace I've never done before. We can now buy equity in the best startups at levels that, in my opinion, we haven't seen since 2008. That being said, let's get the show on the road. The first company in today's lineup is not only growing exponentially, they're also on the cusp of solving the biggest crisis in America, the student debt crisis. Neil, we both went to college. We both know what a racket it is. And we both know that the higher education system in America is utterly broken. In fact, 
the average four-year undergrad degree costs $122,000. For a four-year nonprofit private university, it's nearly $200,000. It takes 21 years on average to pay off these kind of loans. That's exactly why half of all public university students are dropping out. They simply can't afford to stay in school. But what's the solution? Employers won't hire you unless you have a college degree. The solution is to invest in students. What I'm describing is a new type of arrangement between an investor and a student. It's called an income share agreement, or ISA for short. And Neil, I believe it is a real viable solution to a student debt crisis. I've heard of an ISA before. It's when investors handpick the top performing students from top performing schools. They agree to pay a part of their tuition with no interest. But in return, the student pays between 5% and 10% of their future income for a set number of years. That's correct. And this startup's ISAs focus on students who are about to graduate with degrees in some of the highest paying, most in demand professions in America. Professions where the starting salary is typically $80,000 a year or even more. That's what I really like about these ISAs. We all know that loans force students to go into long-term debt. An ISA, however, is linked to their own success. The question is, does the ISA always work out to be a better deal for the student? And how is this company making money from these ISAs? Those are great questions. There's no one who could better answer them than the CEO himself. His name is Charles. Let's dial him in. Hi, Charles. Hey guys, good to see you. Thanks for having me on. So Charles, can you briefly tell us in your own words, how can income share agreements solve the $1.6 trillion student debt crisis? And also, why is your company poised to become the biggest player in the market? Sure. The main benefit of an income share agreement is that we design them to help students reduce the financial risk of attending university or vocational school. Mostly students use student loans to pay for tuition today. But there are a lot of problems with that system. Let's say you take out a 30-year loan for $200,000 to pay for college. You've got to make a payment of about $1,200 a month on that loan three months after you graduate, almost in perpetuity. At a 6% interest rate, you're going to end up paying over $400,000 over 30 years, which is the problem with student loans. Students can end up paying back seven, eight, even 10 times what they borrowed. And so they've really disconnected the price of the education to its value. With our ISAs, you never pay back more than one and a half to two times the tuition. There's a preset payment cap over which your obligation is done. So yes, an ISA is almost always a better deal for the student than a private student loan. So basically, your business model benefits students. Right. When a university rolls out an ISA program, we've seen application rates up two, three, four hundred percent. Uh, because students see this as something very value added. And so there's been over a tenfold increase in the number of schools offering ISAs in the last five years. More enrollment means more tuition revenue for the school. Uh, this, is, this can also help the graduation rate of these schools. Um, for investors on our platform is one of the most powerful cash flow streams there ever has been. It's a super trend. Um, and so it makes these in, unique investments. But the key holdback to ISAs fulfilling their potential in the, uh, in the higher ed ecosystem uh, is funding. And that's the reason why they're not offered by every university, because every school needs outside investors to help sponsor these programs. And that's where we come in. We launched the platform about a year and a half ago, and we have a lot of traction. We funded nearly 3,000 students so far, over $20 million of tuition. And... ISA programs as an alternative to private student loans is very much growing in popularity. You don't have to read very far in the newspaper to realize Americans are not satisfied with the current student loan system. And so as more students realize there's a better alternative to student loans and we continue to sign contracts with new schools, we're in the pole position to be the largest ISA player in the U.S. What I really like here is that you're not selling a fad. You're incentivizing more people to go to school and graduate. You're enabling students to avoid a lifetime of debt. You're giving kids who aren't wealthy enough to get a loan the chance to go to school and graduate with a degree that will likely earn them a lot more money. Correct. The private student loan market in the U.S. is completely dominated by FICO scores and cosigners. And so if you're not from a wealthy family or you don't have a wealthy cosigner, it's very difficult to get a private student loan. And even if you do qualify for private student loans, we're seeing interest rates of over 17%, even for nursing students in their senior year of college. So if you're low or middle income 
uh, family, you've essentially been ignored by the, the system, even if you're a top student. And offering ISAs from our company is, is our way of balancing the scales. We're giving kids who may not come from wealthy families the opportunity to prove themselves over the long run. And that, to us, that's a, that's a noble business model. With that being said, I'll sign off because I know you have a full lineup of deals to cover today. Thank you for having me on. Thank you, Charles. Neil, I want to remind our viewers that this company is less than a year old. So we're talking early seed investing here. Usually, early seed rounds are filled by venture capitalists like us. Everyday investors are traditionally locked out of these deals. That's why the upside potential here is so incredible. We're giving people the chance to be seed investors in a company that could realistically solve the student debt crisis in America and make a ton of money in the process. It's an incredible business model. I know. That's why I'm investing my own money into this company. David, we could probably talk about these guys all day long, but we still have a lot of ground to cover and very little time to do it in. Fintech has become the fastest growing industry in this country. In 2018, $128 billion was invested in fintech. By 2022, that number is expected to hit $310 billion, a 140% increase. You're right, and it's highly disruptive too. 90% of financial institutions now believe that part or all of their business will be lost to fintech companies in the next five years. That's exactly why I just invested in Robinhood with Sequoia Capital, one of the most prolific venture capital firms in Silicon Valley. Robinhood is the fastest growing digital broker in history with over 10 million users. Since I invested with them two months ago, their valuation has gone up about 40%, from just under $8 billion to $11.2 billion. It's one of the fastest valuation increases in Silicon Valley history. That's why fintech is such a game-changing industry. These specialized financial companies are providing better rates, better customer service, and better loan terms. And speaking of better loan terms, now would be a good time to segue into our next startup. For those of you who are watching, this is going to sound a bit crazy, but this startup is actually paying people to get out of debt. That's right, Neil. As long as a borrower is in good standing with their lender, they can receive payments from this company every month for up to three years. It's like a matchmaker. Only, they're not dispensing dating advice. They're matching borrowers with community banks that most people have never heard of. But like a matchmaker, they get paid a fee for matching these banks up with new customers. If someone takes out a $100,000 loan with a small local bank, these guys get paid up to 4% of that loan amount, which in this case would be $4,000. Then, once the borrower starts paying down that loan, the startup puts cash into that person's account every month for up to three years, just for making on-time payments. But that's just the icing on the cake. If you go online, try to get a $50,000 personal loan through LendingTree or NerdWallet or Lending Club, you're only going to see offers from maybe a dozen lenders. And the interest rates from these lenders are probably going to be ridiculous. Even at 9%, I end up paying $80,000 over the course of 10 years for a $50,000 loan. That money adds up quickly. But if you go to the startup's website and apply for that same $50,000 loan, it'll only take you 30 seconds to see a long list of lenders. Plus, those lenders are going to be smaller banks with far better rates, some as low as 2%. So why don't all the online lending marketplaces give you a chance to partner with local banks? Why is this startup the only one? Even though there are 1,100 lenders out there, 10 to 15 of them dominate the online advertising world. The sad part is that millions of people out there are looking for loans right now, especially because of COVID-19. And yet, when they apply for these loans, they're never getting a good deal. Smaller lenders just don't have the advertising and marketing budgets to compete with the larger banks. This is what happens when you have a loan market dominated by a few banks. The borrowers get screwed because they get stuck paying higher rates. Small lenders get screwed because they can't lend to borrowers. Worst of all, our economy gets screwed because more people end up in debt for longer periods of time. I just read that the average person has a personal debt of over $90,000. That's why I was one of the first investors in this business. Their business model benefits everyone. By using their platform, borrowers get better rates on loans, smaller banks get more business, and as long as the borrower is in good standing with the lender, they could get paid every month for up to three years. I love it. It's like a fast pass for getting out of debt, a win-win for everyone. And their co-founder, Harris, has agreed to show us what their platform looks like. Let's get him on the line right now. Hi, Harris. Hey, David, Neil, thank you for the introduction. So yes, this is our platform. 
And as you can see, it's super simple to use. All you have to do is tell us what kind of loan you're interested in, provide us with some information like your name, phone number, email, income, date of birth. And 30 seconds later, your options for your loan will appear. And from left to right, we'll show you a couple different offers. One is for the lowest monthly payment. The next is for your lowest APR. And then finally, the lowest interest rates. So we actually do the sorting for you. So it saves a lot of time. You don't have to sift through all these different lenders like you might on other websites. And then once you make your selection, you just complete the application on the lender's website. So what happens is that we can collect the remaining information from that borrower and then process the loan with the lender ourselves. So that means the customer never has to worry about going into a local bank. Everything is digital 24 seven and always on. And David, keep in mind, uh, we do about $5 million in average daily loan volume right now. And that's just from student loan refinancing. And in September, we're going to add personal loans to the site. We're also going to launch a new feature to the platform that will allow somebody to see rates from over 800 different community lenders in the United States. So this is kind of similar to what Progressive did many years ago in the insurance uh, market that was widely successful where they actually showed rates, not just from themselves, but from other competitors. I also want to point out that since you got started in March, 2020, your monthly loan volume has gone up 340%. And you've already matched lenders with borrowers in 39 states. For a platform that's only six months old, that's amazing. I appreciate that, David. It means a lot coming from you. We're very excited about it. And yes, we expect to be in all 50 states by early 2021. And then at that point, we're projecting around a 214% increase in net income and 105% increase in loan volume. So the investors who come on at this early stage stand to not only reap this exponential growth, but also be a part of the movement to swing the power back to Main Street banks and really democratize lending. And we're going to do it in a way that is new and disruptive by actually paying borrowers back every month to make good on their loans. It's a revolutionary business model. And right now, you're the only platform that I'm aware of that's actually connecting borrowers with these smaller community banks. That's why I'm investing my own money into this company, and I hope others do the same. It's a tremendous opportunity. Harris, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. My pleasure, David. Thank you. I agree, and the potential upside here is tremendous. Demand for all types of loans is probably going to increase each and every single year. On that note, I'd like to move on to the next company in today's lineup. Because in my opinion, this is the most interesting and potential lucrative deal that you've managed to dig up for us. This next startup is only the second company of its kind. It allows investors to tap into the world of traditional private money lending, a $100 billion a year market that regular investors normally can't touch. Just to provide a little background here for our viewers, Private lenders are not banks. These are local lenders who issue quick loans to contractors and real estate developers. The money they use comes from a handful of wealthy people who back their operations. That's right. And these private lenders now number at around 8,300. So let's say you want to purchase a property for $250,000 and you want to put 75 grand into remodeling that property. You're looking at a total all-in cost of $325,000. Problem is, if you go to the bank seeking a loan of that size, it can take three months to process. With a private lender, the process only takes days. Sometimes it happens overnight. Now, if you borrow money from a private lender, you're going to pay a higher interest rate on that loan, usually between 8 and 10%. For contractors, though, it's a minor inconvenience compared to the profit they can make by flipping that property. You know, I've always been fascinated by the world of private money lending. Not just because an estimated 60,000 homes are financed by private money lenders each year, but because these lenders know their communities better than anyone. They know the quality of the schools. They know where the most desirable and undesirable properties are located. They know if a new shopping center is being built and where. They know where crime is and where it isn't. They know which neighborhoods, streets, and houses have the highest and lowest turnover rates. So yes, Private lenders may take on more risk than, say, a traditional bank, but they do so with an immense amount of knowledge behind them. This is why more and more people are going to private lenders for capital, especially right now. In New York's wealthiest neighborhoods, the population has dropped by over 40% this year. 420,000 people have literally emptied out of the city. 
I see it here in LA too. People are fleeing left and right. I can't blame them really. Outside of major cities, schools are better, crime is lower, and property is cheaper. Plus, who needs to live in a city anymore when close to 40% of the population can plausibly do their jobs from home? That's why over 40% of urbanites have been browsing online for real estate. These people are ready to move and buy houses right now. Real estate investors who buy and rehab properties are jumping in to fill that void. As a result, there's been a 37% jump in new loans from private money lenders. I'll admit, the idea of tapping into a very secretive market is intriguing. I'm just a little unsure to how this startup factors into this equation. This company directly buys loans from private lenders. They then sell those loans to institutional investors for a fee. For every loan they sell, they get 0.75% of the loan up front. Okay, so if they sell a million dollar loan to someone like Wells Fargo, they get $7,500 immediately. Exactly. They then collect an additional 1% annual servicing fee on a monthly basis. For a $1 million loan, that would amount to around $10,000 per year. Gotcha. So these guys basically hunt down private money lenders and buy their loans. That part I understand. But what's in it for the private lenders? If I'm a private lender, why would I sell my entire loan portfolio to this company? To free up your capital. If you're a private lender, your funds are always tied with contractors and developers. It's not like you have an infinite well of money to pull from. Freeing up capital is everything for a private lender. It's the only way that they can make more loans. There's another benefit in working with these guys too. If you sell your loans to them, they give access to their proprietary software. And this software is like a private money lender's dream come true. The CEO is gonna give us a demonstration right now. His name is Ray. Let's dial him up. Ray, are you there? I am, it's great to see you guys. Ray, before we begin, I have to ask, the world of private money lending is essentially under lock and key. How do you know so much about this industry? Well, I literally grew up in this business. My mother ran a mortgage business. My father was a private money lender. And I saw firsthand that even though my father was successful, even though he built long lasting relationships with highly skilled contractors, even though he knew which properties to fund and which ones to stay away from, he had a very hard time managing all of the loans he originated. He could never turn around his money fast enough in order to expand his business. He always had to wait until those loans were repaid before issuing new ones. He also never had a simple tool, a point and click solution to organize his existing loans. I would walk into his office and it was always messy folders, misplaced Excel docs, random phone calls, long email chains, etc. It was never an easy job for him. Let's put it that way. This is what motivated me to design a software solution that a lender like my father could have used to simplify his life and possibly double his business, which in turn would have made him more money while providing more housing for more people. As you can see, the software is essentially a one-stop shop for private lenders like my father. It shows a list of all of the lender's loans in one place. They can see details on each property they have, including market characteristics, trends, and appraisals. They can see the number of payments that have been made on each loan and the timing of those payments. They can even communicate with borrowers, upload documents, and buy insurance. So instead of having 10 tabs open just to see everything they need on one loan, they can use our software in order to see their entire portfolio in seconds. They can even upload their loans and get real-time feedback to see if any of those loans fit our criteria. Understand something. We're in the business of buying loans from private lenders, like my father, but we don't just buy any loans. We're extremely selective in the loans we choose to inherit. The last thing I want is to buy a loan from a lender that could possibly default. So we have a list of criteria we need to see before we take any action. So Ray, you're working with around 55 private lenders right now? That's correct. But we expect to add around 100 more over the next 12 months and another 100 in the year after that, most likely. We're an attractive business to all private lenders. Like you accurately said, these guys want nothing more than to sell their loans to my company. This way, they can free up their capital and can make new loans. And I believe our growth is a direct reflection of that. In 2018, we did $33 million. In 2019, we did $250 million. This year, even with COVID causing a massive disruption in the real estate market, we still expect to hit $500 million in loan volume. Next year, we believe we'll reach $1.5 billion. Ray, what I really like about your company is that not only is it an attractive investment, but what you do benefits everyone. You're helping out private lenders grow their business, 
This in turn provides the capital that contractors and developers need to refurbish homes. It's a win-win. The more properties these flippers can turn over, the more houses people can buy. And you're giving investors the chance to tap into an industry that the average investor has not been able to access. That's right. What we do benefits all parties. We're bridging the gap between inst the institutional world and the world of private money lending, a world that everyone wants in on. We're currently selling loans to a number of massive institutional buyers, and we already expect to sign on several more by the end of the year. So this is a very exciting time for our business. And if you ask me, a perfect time for early investors to claim a stake. Ray, I know you're a very busy guy, so I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Anytime, David. Thanks for having me. David, you're very selective with your investment, so it speaks volumes that you're putting up your own money into this startup. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this next company in our lineup is one that you've already put money into as well. Yes, I was actually one of the first investors. But David, unlike the other companies that we've covered so far, this company does not operate in the fintech space. No, they don't. They're a scooter company. I'll be blunt. I know there are 85,000 scooters in 100 cities. I know their numbers are growing exponentially. But if you ask me, I think scooters are a complete eyesore. Here in LA, they're littered across every street, sidewalk, and doorway. Some people are so sick of scooters, they actually started burning them, throwing them into rivers, and even burying them in the sand. I agree with you. Scooters have become a nuisance in a lot of places. Thankfully, the startup has found a viable solution to the problem. We're talking about a fleet of self-driving scooters. Scooters that could literally pick you up at your location, and then when your journey is over, drive themselves back to a charging station and self-sanitize. Whoa, back up, David. You're telling me that I can now summon a scooter like an Uber. The scooter then comes to me on its own. And then when I'm done riding it, the scooter drives itself back to a charging station. That sounds absolutely bonkers. I know it sounds crazy, but these self-driving scooters actually exist. Each scooter has two phone cameras, a piece of radar, a processor, and a motor. This technology enables it to navigate through a crowded park, sidewalk, or street. But Neil, that's not the only reason I'm investing in this company. What makes this company so unique is that they deliberately sign exclusive partnerships with hotels, cafes, museums, restaurants, and apartment buildings. This means their scooters are always docked, which makes them virtually impossible to steal. So let's say I own a hotel in Charleston, South Carolina, and I decide to sign a 10-year agreement with this company. Yes, I'm giving my guests the convenience of renting a scooter, but from a financial standpoint, what's in it for me? By partnering with the scooter company, you, the business owner, can get paid 30% of the ride revenue. So if I have a fleet of 20 scooters outside my lobby doors, and every scooter generates, let's say, $50 a day, that's $1,000 a day. 30% of that is $300 that money goes directly into my pocket. Yes, in fact, one boutique hotel owner in Florida has just made $10,000 off their partnership with a scooter company. And they did that in less than two months. So just like with every other company that we've gone over today, this scooter company's business model benefits all parties. The business owners make more money from scooter revenue. Consumers never have to wander the streets looking for a scooter to ride. This startup gets to turn an underutilized space into a profitable docking station that can net $20,000 in revenue per year. I also want to point out that their scooters are always docked. They don't block traffic. Because of this fact, they've become the first scooter company in 15 major cities. We're talking about cities where dockless scooters are banned. Today, they have 90 hotspots across the country. By the end of this year, they expect to have over 1,200. This may be the first and only scooter company that I've ever come across that is actually turning a profit. Yeah, in fact, in their latest presentation, they've grown their daily revenue by 6,100% in the last 100 days during the COVID pandemic. They literally make 10 times more in daily gross profit than other scooter companies like Lime and Bird. And they expect to generate 40 million in revenue per year beginning in 2021. The best part is, they're still a very early stage company. David, I think now is a good time to remind our viewers that nothing is guaranteed in the world of angel investing. These are still startups and they can just fold just as easily as any other company. And that's why no one should invest more than they can afford to risk in any single startup. But I also wanna remind our viewers that you have a 95% success rate. And yes, by the end of this year, we'll likely have $30 million. With startups, we can make an absolute killing. I'm living proof, but we could also lose everything. That's just the nature of the beast. Which is why you never want to invest all your money into single business. 
it's important to have a portfolio of startups like both of us do. I just want to make sure that message is clear to our viewers. So let's move on to the last company. They're a cannabis producer out of Santa Cruz, California. You and I both know that demand for marijuana products is exploding. Pre-COVID pricing for a pound of legal marijuana was $950 a pound. Today, it's $1,500. Over the next decade, the value of the legal marijuana market is expected to grow from $15 billion to $100 billion. There's never really been a better time to be in the marijuana business. But with thousands of growers out there, why these guys? Two reasons. Number one, they're the first U.S. cannabis cultivator to be qualified by the SEC to sell shares to anyone in the world for as little as $100. Number two, they own 440,000 square feet of greenhouse space on 20 acres of land. That's a huge property, especially in a prime area like Santa Cruz, where the weather is perfect for growing cannabis. From what I know, most greenhouses are between 10,000 and 20,000 square feet. And because demand for cannabis is so strong right now due to COVID, the company is positioned to make around $81 million a year. The fact that this startup is already expected to become cash flow positive by the fourth quarter is pretty rare for a cannabis company. They also have an ingenious campaign to build a nationwide network of 40,000 brand ambassadors by the end of 2022. Understand, in the cannabis industry, name recognition is everything. And these guys are doing everything, and I mean everything they can, to make themselves known throughout the world. So David, I think now's a good time to tell our viewers that today's event is not a one-off situation. We're living in a very unique moment in history. As you've said before, you can now invest in the most promising startups for a fraction of what they should be worth. That's why more than 90% of my money is in private companies. To me, there's never been a better time to be an angel investor. And that's why you've made this decision, to share details on the same investments that you're putting your own money into with our Angels and Entrepreneurs Network for the next year. This way, whenever I invest in a new business, your readers can invest right alongside me if they choose. It's all part of a new initiative I'm starting called Founders and Visionaries. Every other week, I'll share details on a new startup I'm putting my own money into. I'll be interviewing the CEO of these startups and posting those interviews online. I'll also share key facts, figures, data, spreadsheets, and projections for each business. My angels and entrepreneurs team will carefully research and examine each deal you share. We'll look at the financial health of the company, any potential challenges, the management team, business model, and of course, the deal itself. This way, we make sure our readers are getting the very best deal possible. From there, we'll take all of your findings, and if we agree with your research, we'll publish them along with our insights and our analysis. This way, everyone could read about and understand each company on a much deeper level. And again, let me just remind our viewers that these deal recommendations typically involve early stage funding rounds that can often fill in a matter of hours. Sometimes, depending on the company, it can happen in minutes. That being said, I have to limit the number of people who could get access to this research today. I'm talking no more than 250 people. That makes sense. These early seed rounds always come with a limited allocation. Once they're filled, it's over. That's right. And I wanna make sure everyone has a fair shot at getting in. I couldn't agree more. For those of you watching, if you're interested in investing alongside the most effective startup investor in America, click the link below to see if spots are still available. David, like I said earlier, when I started the network a year ago, I knew it would resonate with a lot of people, but I never thought that we would end up attracting the Superman of the private investing world. You started with nothing but a shirt on your back. By the end of this year, you expect to have $30 million in the bank. It's been a great honor to get to do this with you today. Neil, when it comes to making millions of dollars in a very short time span, when it comes to having complete freedom to do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, there's only one path in my mind. And that path is to become an angel investor. David, I honestly can't wait to see how these deals pan out. To those of you watching, the minute you choose to subscribe to David's new initiative, you'll be sent details on every company in today's startup lineup. As a member, you'll have a chance to invest in dozens of private startups. All of them will be examined by the most effective startup investor in America, as well as my own team here at the Angels and Entrepreneurs. However, with only 250 spots available today, these investing rounds may easily fill up in a matter of minutes. So if you ever wanted a chance to invest alongside a living legend, now is the time. Dave is the only venture capitalist I know with a 95% success rate. 
Click the button below and you'll be taken to a brief order form where you can review all the details and secure your spot. On behalf of David, myself, and all the CEOs we heard from today, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me.